This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and live in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been working here since 1993. So I've been a therapist, gosh, 27 years now. I started self-work about four years ago with three things in mind, all three having to do with trying to address some of the ignorance and distrust there is out there about therapeutic treatment for mental health. So I'm just reaching out to those of you who are already comfortable and maybe even in therapy, you're comfortable with psychological and emotional issues, to those of you who have been initially diagnosed with something that you're curious about and need more information about, perhaps you're in a relationship where you're struggling and some advice would really help, also to a third group, those of you who feel like you'd never darken the door of a therapist, but you're just curious enough to listen in to a podcast like Self Work to see, well, what does one sound like anyway? What would they have to say that might be helpful? So I'm that someone, and I'm delighted to be that someone. I hope y'all enjoyed my You Get the Gist, the first segment I did about what's going on in mental health these days, just four to five minutes of my thoughts what I read about, and how this might affect your life. It was fun doing it, and we'll probably do it every couple of weeks or so. I also want to quickly invite you to the Happy, Healthy, and Fit Revolution. I'm one of 21 speakers. It's a free series on being healthy and fit, both mentally and physically. And a woman named Heather Benz is doing it, who is a fitness guru. She's a best-selling author, and I was delighted to be invited I'll have this link in the show notes, but it is http colon slash slash www.happyhealthyandfitrevolution.com slash Margaret underscore Rutherford. So basically, happyhealthyandfitrevolution.com slash Margaret underscore Rutherford. And you can see if it would appeal to you. Again, it's free and it starts September the 28th and she's going to feature one speaker a day, I think. So again, just wanted to let you know what's going on. Again, and I'll have the link in the show notes. Today, trust had been on my mind as a topic that would be helpful to talk about, and I do have some things to say about working on trust in a relationship that I hope will be helpful. But what kept coming up for me in really a fairly serendipitous way was when I looked up when trust was broken, and what I kept finding were articles on trauma bonding, What is a trauma bond? How does it form? Why is it important for that dynamic to have its own label or name? Trauma bonding happens when trust is highly manipulated, when commitment and trying to make a relationship work is used against someone as a way to keep them in denial or disbelief that the relationship is actually harmful to them. I've been there, and I thank my lucky stars I got out. I still actually have never revealed all that happened in that relationship, So much of it is now such clear abuse that I'm flabbergasted. I didn't see it for what it was, but I didn't. Or I did, but then my need to make the relationship work went to work, and I stayed. I found some authors who've written about it to help shine some light on the why and the how of trauma bonding. Patrick Carnes may have been the first, and will give his definition of trauma bonding as well as the broader one. It's also been associated with Stockholm Syndrome, And we'll talk about that as well. I'll use also some material from John Kim, who's a therapist who calls himself the Angry Therapist, and he actually has his own books, and I believe he has a podcast. So we'll hear what he has to say. Our listener email for today is from someone who wants some answers about enmeshment and what she terms covert narcissism. It sounds like she's the daughter and feels enmeshed or has been told, perhaps, that she's enmeshed with her father. It's very much like our topic or similar to our topic, so I thought it meshed well. In fact, I think probably some people would say that enmeshment is another kind of trauma bonding. So there'll be a lot of information in this episode, once again sponsored by BetterHelp. We'll talk about Stockholm Syndrome, trauma bonding, covert narcissism, and as always, what you can do about it, or at least 
try to do about it. So welcome to episode 199 of Self Work. I started out this week thinking about writing about trust. I was probably talking about it in a session, which is where I get a lot of ideas for podcast episodes. Trust obviously has to be earned, or actually maybe not so obviously. Perhaps many of us, when we love someone or are caught up in feelings of incredible excitement and lust love, as I call it, maybe we hand our trust to our new love interest and they haven't done anything to deserve it at all. In fact, sometimes it's just the opposite. They've done things that you discount or ignore or are told that's not what they meant to say or do, and yet you go along. To me, trust in very simple terms. Trust in a relationship happens when you believe and are shown regularly that someone keeps you in their mind when they're making a decision. Whether it's your child, your friend, your parent, or your partner, you believe, and again, have evidence that when they're at the store, they think of you because they pick up your favorite type of cereal. When someone is coming on to them at a party, if it's your partner, they don't flirt back and even stop that kind of thing in its tracks. They don't lie to you. They are where they say they're going to be, at least as much as humanly possible. It's naive to believe, and perhaps I'm a bit cynical after being a therapist for years, that others don't have to earn your trust. But I know it happens all the time. Trust is handed out like it's free candy at Halloween, all in the name of love. When you fall in love, you forget, or perhaps you never knew, about the need for proof. That part is skipped where the earning or the showing begins, earning your trust, showing that they're trustworthy. Maybe that's even a new idea for many of you. Now that leads me to the topic of trauma bonding, But before we get there, here's a message from BetterHelp with a very special offer for you. When I was approached by BetterHelp now several months ago, COVID had emerged. And I'd maybe conducted a handful of telehealth sessions, mostly when someone was sick and couldn't make it into the office. Now, five months later, I'm even more of a believer in telehealth. It took some getting used to. But actually, clients sometimes seem more relaxed, it fits better into their schedule, and although many have told me they miss seeing me in person, it's still been a very fulfilling relationship. I've even started new patients, and they've told me they had positive experiences, so we've never actually met in person. BetterHelp is rated the number one online therapy service that's available to you wherever you live. Confidential and highly personalized It's much less expensive than normal talk therapy. You can text, have video chats, or just talk on the phone. You outline what you're looking for, and BetterHelp suggests several therapist options for you. If you don't seem to find a way to connect with one, they'll ask you more about what you're looking for, and then suggest others. I, of course, tried it out before I was going to recommend it to you, and the two therapists I had sessions with listened well and made great suggestions for me, and one said, actually... I might make myself. I talked about my own panic disorder and a very scary situation I'd been through, and they were caring and thoughtful. And I was amazed at how easy it was to get in touch with them to make time changes, for example. Although BetterHelp can't be there in emergencies, nor could any online provider, they have all kinds of information about what you can do in that special circumstance. And today, BetterHelp has a great savings offer for you. If you use the link trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork, again, that's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork, you can enjoy a 10% discount on your first month of sessions. After five months of seeing how people relate to telehealth, I'd highly recommend it. If self-work has helped you, maybe BetterHelp can give you an even more personal experience with therapy. When I realized all of this about trust, that too many people forget the showing or proving part, that's when the topic of trauma bonds came to mind. For certainly, trauma bonds occur when you enter a relationship and from the very beginning your trust is manipulated. I don't quote Wikipedia very often in these episodes, but I thought their paragraph on trauma bonding was very clear and succinct. So here's the first part of that paragraph. 
Traumatic bonding occurs as the result of ongoing cycles of abuse in which the intermittent reinforcement of reward and punishment creates powerful emotional bonds that are resistant to change. Okay, let's take this apart. First, what does an intermittent reinforcement of reward and punishment mean? This actually goes back to the behavioral school of psychology, and if you've ever taken a Psychology 101 course, you've probably heard about it. But let me refresh your memory. First, positive reinforcement is when you reward a behavior. You're trying to get a certain response, so you reward it. You give the response you want, positive attention. Your dog, for example, gets a treat when she rolls over or just when she makes the initial move to roll over. In negative reinforcement, the response you want, your dog rolling over, is accomplished by the dog learning it can avoid something bad happening, like you yelling at the poor dog, by rolling over. It learns by avoidance. For any of you raised in a home with an alcoholic, you did all kinds of things to avoid your alcoholic parent getting mad at you, creating a scene. You were actually offering up the behavior you thought they wanted in order to avoid what might happen if you didn't. But the strongest kind of reinforcement is actually what's called intermittent reinforcement, meaning it doesn't happen consistently. It happens every once in a while, intermittent. What is that? It's when a reward like a treat or a punishment, you yelling, doesn't happen every time the behavior you want occurs. Basically, your dog doesn't know how many times she's going to have to roll over to get a treat. Or you don't know in that alcoholic home what you have to do or not do to prevent them from screaming at you. The screaming happens randomly. So you'll even more urgently and consistently continue to do the behavior to either be rewarded positively or avoid the punishment. I hope that's clear. So someone who's manipulative will use intermittent reinforcement to begin to cultivate the behavior in you that they want. Basically, you're never able to quite figure out what you do or don't do that has to do with them being attentive or kind or even available or not being punishing. When they are available, the attention can be over the top. But when it's not, you're abandoned for reasons the manipulator will tell you are your fault. Just think about someone you're beginning to have a relationship with, you're really getting into them, who texts you back a lot at first. You're developing all kinds of warm, loving responses to them. And then the texts slow down or even stop. But amazingly, right about the time you're about to give up, they come back, usually with a reason why they haven't been able to text So they start up again. Then it stops. Now again, when it's good, it's very good. So you stick around. I told you I was going to quote John Kim, the angry therapist. He calls this when a relationship gets sticky. You can't get yourself unstuck. You're trying to understand the going and coming, the disappearing and the reappearing. But the manipulator makes it about you. And yet you don't know what you've done or not done. It's when things get ugly or mean or abusive, that's when this dynamic can become so dark. Patrick Carnes, who was the first person to begin talking about sexual addiction and who has fought for that to be recognized in our culture for what it is, a true diagnostic entity, he developed the word trauma bond. Now we're going to go back to Wikipedia. Patrick Carnes developed the term for trauma bond as being the misuse of fear, excitement, sexual feelings, and sexual physiology to entangle another person. A simpler and more encompassing definition is that traumatic bonding is a strong emotional attachment between an abused person and his or her abuser formed as a result of the cycle of violence. As I continued to look up trauma bonding, Stockholm Syndrome kept coming up, Even some sources saying it's the same thing, but I don't really see it that way. I think it's a special case of trauma bonding. So what is Stockholm Syndrome? The term is most associated with Patty Hearst. This is from a BBC article. The California newspaper heiress who was kidnapped by revolutionary militants back in 1974. Many of you probably weren't born then. (laughs) She appeared to develop sympathy with her captors and joined them in a robbery. I remember the famous picture of her with a gun. She was eventually caught and received a prison sentence. But her defense lawyer, 
claimed that the 19-year-old had been brainwashed and was suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, a term that had been recently coined to explain the apparently irrational, positive, or even loyal or protective, even grateful feelings of some captives for their captors. Later in that article, it also stressed that captors also can develop feelings for their captives, and yet they blame getting to know them personally for bad things happening. You can begin to hear the stickiness, as John Kim says. I should also point out that Stockholm Syndrome is very rare, but it does happen. So let's stop for a second and try to figure out how you know if you're in a trauma bond. Here's what John Kim had to say in his article. It's very well put. The link will be in the show notes. The reward and punishment dynamic, and here he's talking about that intermittent reinforcement, trains us to want, desire, and fix the relationship, partly because we tie our worth to the love we get. So if we don't get love, we believe we are worthless. When we get love, we believe we are worth more. And since we all want to feel worthy, we wait, we fix, we make excuses, negotiate, compromise, put our needs aside, and change our behavior to get that love. Because then it means we have more worth or value. Especially if we've been conditioned this way from our childhood. That's a whole other layer, but it adds fuel to this repetition of the cycle. And the longer we are in this cycle, the stronger the bond. And now he makes a really good point in what I hear all the time. This bond then can be mistaken for chemistry or sexual attraction. He continues, That's why for many the only thing that changes in our relationship is faces. We keep falling into the same type of dysfunctional relationship because inconsistent, conditional, and chaotic love generates that strong bond we're used to and it draws us in. And we sadly define this pull as chemistry. That's what Pat Carnes was talking about as well. Let me repeat his definition. The misuse of fear, excitement, sexual feelings, and sexual physiology to entangle another person. Entangle is such a fascinating word. It's not to connect with you. It's not to honor you. It's to entangle you. How many times as a therapist have I heard someone say, They just don't do it for me, or I'm not into him or her, often before they ever give that someone else a chance. I remember a woman I worked with who asked me why she was always attracting extremely wealthy, narcissistic men, and she did over and over. I'd watched her very painfully go from getting swept off her feet, the sex was great, there were gifts and trips, but then she was highly manipulated and eventually abandoned. First, I asked her where she was meeting them, and she answered some bar in town with $17 drinks. We laughed together, and she realized she might as well go to the Mexican place a couple of doors down and order a beer and see who she met. But then we got down to much more serious matters. She actually had deep insecurity about caring for herself and her children. She thought she wasn't smart. Actually, her first very narcissistic husband had told her that. She had no tangible evidence. In fact, had held down a very good job. For years. She thought she needed that kind of financial backing and was willing to put up with just about anything to get it. She'd say she'd meet some perfectly nice man, but they just didn't have it. The it was her own need and insecurity screaming at her, but she interpreted it as attraction. Hopefully you can hear the almost magnetic-like quality of these relationships, where the person who is getting manipulated is drawn in because of their own need to feel worthy and valuable. So, what do you do about it? First, you have to see it. And it may seem easy to see, but it's not. I said in the intro this had happened to me, and it did. It wasn't until I was in an environment, which was grad school, where my own competence was acknowledged and nourished, that I finally began to see it. Before then, I had blatantly lied to my family about my partner's attentiveness, I was desperately trying to hide my marriage's problems and painted to the world that all was well. But my eyes were becoming more clear. I saw, finally, what I didn't want to see. That included seeing my own actions, by the way, not just his. My desperation, my clinging, my need, my fear and anger, my denial, my part in the relationship seductiveness and what that meant to me, my own problems with esteem. It was more than sticky. At times it felt like superglue and that I'd remain obsessive about the relationship. I finally let really nice be more important than exciting. 
I allowed kindness to make a difference. I absorbed and hopefully gave a kind of love that was more mature, not as sticky, still very exciting, but in a different way. But the most important change was in the way I saw myself, that I was worth being loved well and knowing I had the capacity to love well back. So, the hard part, but the very vital part, is recognizing a trauma bond for what it is. You have to work very hard on creating a new pattern of choices in yourself and then see where that leaves you. Maybe your partner will come along with you. Maybe both of you could work to change this very damaging dynamic. But please don't allow their inability or unwillingness to change stop you. It's too important. You're too important. Again, this listener email is very close to this subject. So let's hear what she's talking about. Hi, I was just wondering, is it possible to heal from enmeshment if your father is a covert narcissist? I'm just finding this all out now for the first time. And this whole enmeshment thing is new to me. So I'd appreciate any advice that you have. Thank you. This listener is asking about what's termed covert narcissism. So first, what is that? Here are some basic traits from an article in Very Well Mind. Remember, narcissism, like anything else, is on a spectrum. And of course, you have to remember trauma bonds are often with people with narcissistic features. I don't think I said that before. I think there are five or six of these very passive self-importance where the more overt narcissist lets everyone know that they crave the feeling of importance and they thirst for admiration. The covert narcissist is the same, but it can look very different around them. They might give backhanded compliments or minimize their own accomplishments or talents so that people will offer them reassurance of how talented they are. They may even appear shy or insecure, but they thirst as well for admiration. The second is blaming and shaming. The introverted covert narcissist may have a more gentle approach to explain why something is your fault and they're not to blame. They might even pretend to be a victim of your behavior. And then it's your job to give them reassurance and praise. But they are blaming and shaming. They also create confusion, somewhat like gaslighting, which we've talked about. But it's not quite as harsh. You'll still end up questioning your own perceptions. However, did I really get that right or whatever. The third is procrastinating and disregard. Rather than explicitly telling you you're not important, they'll do things like standing you up for a lunch date or wait to respond to texts, never really confirm plans with you. There's just little regard for your time or interests, so they leave you feeling small and unimportant. They're also emotionally neglectful. You do all the emotional work in this relationship. So although they appear kinder, then their extroverted counterpart, they're not emotionally available either. They don't have the ability to show empathy. And then the last one is giving with a goal. Basically, these people love conditionally. And they want people to know and consider them really good givers. The article in Very Well Mind used this example. Maybe they put a tip in a jar at a local coffee shop but the covert narcissist would put it in when they know the barista is looking in order to facilitate some kind of interaction that allows them to be praised. Now, our listener says she's enmeshed with her dad, meaning probably that she's been pulled in by him to please him and meet his needs, not in a sexual way, or if that's the truth, then this listener needs to seek immediate treatment and help so that appropriate legal action can be taken. But she seemed to indicate it was more emotional enmeshment. Here is my answer to her. If you're financially dependent still on your father, this can be tricky. But basically, you've made the first step by recognizing this dynamic. Most likely, your father will not be able to see it. You also don't mention your mother, whether or not she could be helpful in this. Hopefully, other family members have seen this and could give you some support. But because it's covert, they may not see it. Here's my basic message. You're not going to get permission to grow up and leave your dad or to have your own life from him. You have to give yourself that kind of permission. I'd invest in the book The Emotional Incest Syndrome by Pat Love. It's the best book I know that covers how to set boundaries with someone who needs you to be there for them. But again, you're not going to get permission. And because they're covertly narcissistic, 
They, again, will try to create confusion. They'll blame you. They'll talk about abandonment, not perhaps in anger, but in pity. But still, they will have very little empathy with you or what pain this dynamic has caused in you. Good luck to you. Thanks again for being here at Self Work, the 199th episode. We're planning something kind of fun for episode 200, so I hope you'll be here next week. I want to thank those of you who've left Amazon reviews for the book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. It goes up and down, but gosh, with now 96 ratings and reviews, it really says to people, hey, this book is worth reading. So thank you so very, very much. And if you have read it, please feel free to email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and I'll answer your questions. We also talk about the book a lot, or Perfectly Hidden Depression a lot, in my Facebook closed group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. You can also subscribe to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com, and that's a really easy way of receiving this podcast weekly, as well as my weekly blog post, and just to find out what's going on. Again, I'll leave that link to the Happy, Healthy, and Fit Revolution for all of you in the show notes, and I hope you can join me. I really was impressed with the speakers that she has amassed. And wow, 816 of you, as of this date, have said something on Apple Podcasts about self-work. Last week, self-work was number 39 in all the mental health podcasts in the United States, and I have you to thank for that. Because you're telling people you enjoy it, you're giving it a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts, and so you're my best advertisement, my best marketing. Thank you so very much. Lots of information in this episode, really very serious topics, but ones that I found so personally freeing. My life has been very different because of my understanding of trauma bonds, so I hope it will help you. And again, you can always email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com if you've got questions. Thank you once again for being here. Take very good care in these very difficult times to all of you in the Pacific Northwest in the United States and the Southeast with flooding. We're all thinking about you. Please take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.